the announcement. This coming uh, training, uh, the topic will be transformative community conference that will be taking place at traditional Bagai School, uh, Eastern Mennonite, so Eastern Mennonite University, and the facilitator will be David Anderson Hooker. That will be February 16 to, uh, to February 17, Eastern Mennonite University. Please visit our website for more information and registration. Another announcement I just want to make clear uh, to raise your, your awareness about the coming webinar starting in January. We, we have a series of webinars uh, which will, will, will start January 17, as you see on, on slide over there. Just take a look, visit the website for more information and registration. Now I want to invite Wonshe to take from here. Welcome, everyone. Um, I am happy to be here. My name is Wong Shea. I am a restorative justice practitioner here living in the Valley, the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and I welcome you to this restorative justice listening. Wong Shea, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Wong Shea. Uh, okay, what do I do? So, I you can't hear me. I could hear her just fine. You could? I, I could mm -hmm. hear her too. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You're good. Should I start over? Yeah. yeah, I can hear also. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a little cut. Uh, not certain if everybody heard me, so I'm going to start all over and say welcome, everyone, to the Restorative Justice Listening Project Report. Uh, my name is Wan Shea. I am a restorative justice practitioner living here in the Shenandoah Valley, and I'm quite pleased that I've been invited to be your host for today. While I am a CJP graduate, I originally learned about the guiding principles of restorative justice from First Nation elders here in the States, uh, though of course it wasn't called restorative justice. The teachings um, were part of their spiritual practice and not called restorative justice. I am very excited to as you have the opportunity to listen directly from our panel members about where we are as a movement and their thoughts about our future. Uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel guests. First, we have Sonia Shaw, who is Associate Professor at California Institute of Integral Studies. She brings 20 years of experience in social justice education and 10 years experience in restorative justice. Her work continues to demonstrate for us her commitment to the collective building of the restorative justice movement. Sonia, we're so happy that you're here today. Thank you for joining us. With his work in peace building, transitional justice, and restorative justice taking him to 35 countries, we are grateful to have Carl Stoffer here with us at Eastern Mennonite University. Carl teaches restorative justice and transitional justice at the Center for Justice and Peace Building, and he is also co-director of the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice, both here at EMU. Carl, welcome and thank you. Um, Sarah King, also a CJP graduate, uh, graduate of the Center for Justice and Peace Building, has 10 years of restorative justice experience and is currently on staff at the Minnesota Department of Corrections Victim Assistance and Restorative Justice Unit. Sarah's been a tremendous support as the project assistant, and Sarah, I want to thank you for contributing yet again to our panel today. Okay, so let me just share my screen real quick. <clears throat> Is that in slide for everybody? There we go. Wonderful. All right, so just to make sure everyone's in the right place, we're going to be talking about the Restorative Justice Listening Project final report. Um, Sonia Shah, Carl Stoffer, and myself were the three that worked on this project for the past year. Um, actually less than a year. So we will talk through the whirlwind that was 
that experience. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of just kind of the background and, and what we did and how we did it. Carl is going to talk about the trends. Um, Sonia is going to cover recommendations. They're both going to talk a bit about history and language in terms of restorative justice, peacemaking, and kind of all of that um, beautiful mess a, a bit. And then um, we'll have some personal reflections from the three of us and also um, hoping to hear from you guys about how this report can be used, um, obviously questions that you might have, but hopefully there are some people on the Zoom today that were participants in the project. So it'd be great to hear from them as well. If you haven't seen the report yet um, or haven't accessed it, there's a link there on the page. Um, it's hosted at the Zare Institute website and also on Sonia's Ahimsa Collective website. So um, if you wanna just search that real quick, um, the what we're going to talk through, we have some page numbers that correlate to the topics we'll be talking about. So if you want to follow along on the report, you're more than welcome to. So brief overview. Um, all of this kind of started in January of, of this year, um, <clears throat> slash February, with the key question of what is the maximum impact we in the restorative justice movement want to have? Hang on want to see or can imagine emanating from the movement in the next decade. Um, so that question surfaced and through fortuitous circumstances, Carl and Sonia had recently met over last summer at a conference and perfect storm of different ideas coming together. And so the listening project was born to, to answer that question and to really speak with people um, doing this work in their local context and, and how best to inform how to do this going forward. So briefly, um, we had, we decided that it would be the best use of time and resources to kind of identify a few different key hubs, knowing that there's any possible way that we could get to everybody everywhere um, and to hear from everyone in order to make this an efficient process. Um, so we ended up going with one, two, three, four, five sites plus a working session. So I'll just cover those real quick. Um, with site selection, we really wanted to focus on a diversity of different demographics of people who are working restorative justice. So urban, rural, First Nations, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. Really wanted to get to more of Canada. It wasn't possible, but I think Vancouver did a good job of, of speaking to some of the work that they're doing up there. Um, so this was really just an effort at getting a state of the state restorative justice, kind of just getting a pulse on the movement, um, creating this shared roadmap and something that we can at least offer recommendations to advocates and donors and knowing that that is going to be a living document and living recommendations that will hopefully be amended and changed over time as that as that makes sense. So we had Minnesota and Maryland were sessions that we had in February. Um, I co-facilitated Minnesota and then Maryland had Lauren Abramson with the Community Conferencing Center. Vancouver, the Bay Area and Navajo Nation were all in March. Um, Catherine Bargain with the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General co-facilitated Vancouver. Ashley George with Impact Justice was with the Bay Area. And then Chief Justice Robert Yazi um, co-facilitated for the Navajo Nation. And he is a former Supreme Court Justice um, of the Navajo Nation Supreme Court. And then, I'm sorry, Chief Justice. And he is currently a law professor at Navajo Technical University. And then once we had gathered all of that data and our preliminary findings, we had a working group meeting in Virginia, um, which included all of the co-facilitators and then a few other folks from different regions or um, intersecting disciplines who weren't well represented in the original five sessions. So that was how that all broke down. We had 130 unique participants. 100 of them came from a Western restorative justice lens or paradigm and then the other 30 were from Indigenous backgrounds. So it was a really rich conversation um, and I think it's, we'll talk more about that as we continue. And then briefly in terms of methods, so each session was an eight hour facilitation. Sonia Shaw served as lead facilitator for all sessions. Um, and so we did a, a mix of small group breakout sessions covering different topics that you can see very well articulated in the, in the report. And then we also had a survey. So that was more of an individualized effort to find out who was doing what, where, with whom, what does their funding structure look like? So real, real quick, um, for the participants, for the people who responded to the survey, most of them were working at the community or interpersonal level with either youth or adults. So most of them were working in diversion, the criminal legal system, or K through 12 schools. Most categorized their work as focusing on trauma healing, and most represented, the most represented intersecting discipline was victim and survivor services, um, which 
I think it's fantastic um, to have to have those voices be a part of this process. Um, and yeah, it was. If if you look at the report, you will see kind of the, all the different graphs and what other people said. It was really really rich. And then we also asked questions around funding. Um, I think two important pieces to note is that 44% of respondents named the government as their main source of funding. And the majority of these people's funding cycles were for one year. So that greatly informed our recommendations around sustainable funding and what that could potentially look like in the future. Carl, you're up. And you're moving. Carly, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> You're and welcome, everyone. It's really good to be uh, back together and talking to the listening report here. Um, thanks to our editor, um, David, who did some great work of sort of um, overviewing what we've done. I'm going to talk a little bit to the overview of the trends and we're gonna put those into three categories, sort of a general consensus of what we heard almost in every site, uh, where some of the tensions were the, were the highest, um, and uh, then strategies that emerged as we uh, had the conversations in the five sites. So there was a general consensus from almost every site that restorative justice is vibrant and growing. And you'll notice that we didn't say what restorative justice is. That wasn't the general consensus, but there was a consensus that there's some movement and energy that's more than usual, and that there's a kind of, we're on a cusp of a kind of movement that people were energized by and passionate about. There was certainly a call for more coordination and connection in every place we went, particularly amongst practitioners and nonprofits. Um, and the, the just a real, real ur, um, urgency to, to collaborate and, and come together and, and make sure that the impact is bigger than just individuals or individual organizations. We clearly had um, a lot of conversation around um, the roots of RJ. And as we all know from the, from if we've been reading the, the, the material out there, as well as from our own experience, um, there's this interplay uh, between Western and, um, and indigenous, and we need to name both of those roots and give them space. And at the same time, there was a real sense of how do we work together? How do we give space to our own language and uh, culture and worldviews in those two root systems? Um, there was certainly a call for Westerners uh, in the RJ or non-indigenous folks working in the RJ movement to see restorative justice from its uh, contemporary Western form as um, separate from their holistic life ways. And so not sort of impose um, or assume that all the values and the worldviews are the same. And at the same time, indigenous practitioners um, were, were asking for us to work together, but to hear each other, to listen to each other, to respect, um, and to share the focus on community and healing and um, to, to resist the sort of top-down enforcement of uh, a sort of Western professionalized um, form of practice. It is, and finally on the consensus, there was certainly um, a consensus around the quality of RJ work being very important and that it should fully embody our values. And, and so the values that drive our work should be explicit, should be clear, and should be driving what we do. Uh, how, what form that uh, quality of RJ work or practice comes in was up for some discussion. So the tensions really revolved, um, there were many, I mean, there were many different kinds, but in, in broadest terms, um, one of the major tensions, tensions I believe that was there was really this idea of um, what is restorative justice as a practice? And there was those who wanted to focus, define, clarify, specialize. Um, there's a number of words we could use about that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about how we feel restorative justice has evolved. Um, and then those who really felt like, no, this is something that, that um, is much, much more than a, providing a social service within the criminal legal justice system. 
Um, and, it's, and then there was others who said, no, we need to change the whole system. This is about working outside of the system to dismantle it. And then others saying, this is a social justice movement. It's far beyond just the criminal justice system. Let's not only attach our identity and our definition to the criminal justice system. And let's think about this as an embodied holistic way of life. So there was, there was those variations, um, certainly, and everyone wanting to uh, claim the parts of restorative justice that were beneficial and useful for them, the, the, the themes and the terms. And so I think there was sort of a call for how can we hold these tensions together in, in, in one umbrella possibly. Um, and certainly the issue that, that was mentioned before of practitioners being certified, best practices, professionalization, standardization, all of that um, as one avenue towards upholding quality of our work. While many saw this also as a threat to community involvement and local wisdom and to, um, as a way of marginalizing certain um, practice on the ground in communities all across this country and in North America. So those were um, major tensions. There were obviously others. Some of the strategies that emerged as we began to, or as we continued the conversation, there was a lot of call for teaching and practicing RJ values from the bottom up. Um, lovely language around pillars of wisdom as opposed to best practices as one way of framing our work, again, that would need to be fleshed out. There was a call for more trainings, which was interesting because in the original, uh, in the origins, in the beginnings of the Western sort of restorative justice practice in the 70s, there was many trainings. And, but now there was, a, there was a strong call for that again, uh, sort of a popular call for getting skills, but skills grounded in a particular worldview and set of values that were meaningful to the movement now. Um, and at the cent and in that and related to that is centering the indigenous wisdom roots and current practices. It's a strong call for um, the movement to hold very carefully and closely and boldly to anti-racism and anti-oppression training, not only training, but uh, walking that out in personal work and in the way we do our circles um, and particularly calling the white communities that are working in restorative justice to, to enter into the debate of um, white privilege and racism, white supremacy with, with openness and, and clarity. Um, there was certainly, when it came to structure, uh, a lot of interest in how could we creatively and innovatively look at new structures that would um, defy the top-down national structures that we're used to. Um, there was a strong call for regional organizations or decentralized national networks and particularly bolstering local um, coalition building and community-based efforts. Um, there was a strong uh, caution around being co-opted by the systems and institutions and hierarchical structures um, and the dangers that surround that. And so I think there was that caution was clear. And finally, whatever is built centered on the restorative justice values, relationships, and um, equity. So both in our relationships and in our structural work, these were the calls. So that was in a very brief whirlwind uh, tour of the trend that sort of came out of the, out of the, the um, project report. Okay, hey folks, it's Sonia. I think I'm up. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can actually see our faces or you're just looking at the slideshow, so either way. Um, I think I just want to start out by saying, you know, what a tremendously wonderful task this was. I feel really privileged to be a part of it, um, as well as like a lot of, I think I want to offer first an apology to anyone who felt um, that, um, oh, we can see your face. Thanks, Tara. Um, <laughs> who felt like you know, their voice wasn't represented or something wasn't heard or why did we choose something over the other? What I can say as somebody who sat in every single one of these sessions and, uh, with Sarah and kind of had this, these moments of like, how, how, how the hell are we gonna do justice to all of the beautiful ways that um, all of these people have been showing up and, and kind of talking about our work, our shared values, our worries, our anxieties. Um, there was kind of an impossibility of the task. Um, so I want to see that starting out, and we really did the best that we could looking through um, everything, all of the material, all of our memory, 
to create um, as a best of a, a report as possible. So um, with that, talking about recommendations, um, I think one of the things based on what you've heard so far that has been really helpful for me personally as a, as a person in the RJ movement, and maybe I offer this as, as something helpful, is to both consider kind of the slice of restorative justice that you're really deeply involved with, whether it is in schools or it's in the justice system or it's with victim services or with community or an academic, and also to hold like what you're doing and how it needs to be defined as really urgent and important, as well as to see its relationship to the whole and all of the other places where restorative justice, restorative justice practices, peacemaking circle process and restorative practices I think I got all the terms are happening. And um, to consider, it's just a question whether there's an opportunity for us to create sort of a big tent um, or and just sort of see our relationship um, between all of these things um, it, moving forward. It, got, it was very clear in the very beginning um, that there, if we're like really we're talking about when someone's talking about restorative justice until we know their social location, it's really difficult to really understand where that person is coming from or where we're coming from, right? So that what, get, what got really clear is that there's really distinct locations of restorative justice. Um, and if, if we were to try to characterize those into like four, there's probably more, more distinct locations. It's indigenous restorative justice, it's restorative justice that's happening in community-based um, organizations and organ community and just in community. Um, it's people who are in systems and institutions um, and it's um, people in the schools. And so we started with that and then we started to work from there. And one of the, 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 uh, one of the very large recommendations that we put right up front is really this notion of supporting indigenous peacemaking and restorative justice practices as determined, of course, by indigenous people in their own context. Um, and I think I just want to offer this quote. Um, the, you know, when we were in the, the Navajo Nation, I think there were about 26 people there. The Navajo have um, peacemaking practices that their own Navajo way of doing traditional um, conflict resolution and um, resolution of harm um, that is steeped in Navajo thinking and the fundamental law of the Diné. It's their own practice. They've had it forever. And just like Wanche said in the beginning, um, that you know, this is something that I learned from my elders, and we never called it restorative justice. That was a really common theme. Like, yes, we're doing this. We don't call it restorative justice, but when we listen to what everybody was doing, it was pretty much the same thing, right? So, um, so just to, to really recognize that, um, and I, I want to read this quote because it just sort of characterized um, the, the second piece of this, which is that to really understand if we're supporting holistic worldviews in terms of restorative justice, right? That we're thinking about healing and justice as something that is interdependent and relational um, and that they go together. And so in a holistic way of thinking about this, we're not separating out justice from healing, from culture, from family, from language. It all relates to the other thing. In the Navajo Nation, there is a really strong sense that if we're, as we're doing peacemaking, as we're doing restorative justice, we're also talking about colonization. We're talking about um, speaking again in our language and you know, being in our cultural practices. And so this one student said this, um, her name was Melissa. And she said, I've been at Navajo Technical University for three and a half years. I was considered the white girl. I don't speak Navajo. I was a straight A student. I used to sit in Justice Yazzie's class and he'd draw the circle and I didn't get it. I just say, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Then one day I started to understand it. Once I really understood the fundamental law, it changed my life forever. And I take it to my beadwork and everything I do. The circle saved my life, and when my sister died, it was the only thing that got me through. I realized that this isn't something that you just do, but it's something that you become inside of yourself and all your experiences. And I think that that sort of captures, in essence, the notion of circle um, peacemaking and restorative justice and why that's been such a big part of the recommendations. Um, the second recommendation was around and it came out of our Virginia session very much was the sense of people wanting some structure, but thinking of it more like a web and decentralized, really the key being decentralized um, uh, as a con sort of organizations or people that really can play the role of convener, um, convening hubs and regional locations together so that we can network and do various kinds of restorative work together. 
Um, and there doesn't have to be one, there can be multiple, there can be regional hubs um, and some national kind of bodies. But the real strong focus on the decentralized um, was certainly there. Um, in tandem was that was perhaps creating some sort of uh, restorative justice fund that could support mid-sized and local uh, community-based organizations. The third piece was on this notion of the full integration of social justice values into restorative justice. Now, I think this is really like, it probably for me was one of the most interesting aspects of the listening session, because depending on, I think, who was speaking, um, that, that question was very different. So um, for marginalized communities, social justice is kind of often embedded in just how we show up in the world. Um, working with our struggles, working with our identity, working with oppression, it's not something that we do or, um, or we figure out how to participate in, it's something that we are. Um, and I think it, this really speaks to kind of these two different like lineages and places of restorative justice of folks that maybe come from a different lineage of restorative justice that have really seen it. And Carl's gonna describe more of this kind of history of RJ as a social service that has moved into kind of a movement. Um, if you're you know, coming from that place of that's how I've engaged with restorative justice as a practice, but not that's completely embedded within my identity. This question kept emerging of like, how do we make this more of a social justice movement? Um, or it's not a social justice movement. Um, and that's really clear. And I think for people that were living more their identities of restorative, of, of sort of their social justice identities, um, their identities of people of color, of marginalized folks, it was, there was very little question that this was a movement that we, that we were working in tangentially with other movements. Um, or for some communities of color, for some people of color, it was very clear that restorative justice wasn't um, a social justice uh, movement. And I would say that really, I, I give two examples, the difference between the Bay Area and, and, and Baltimore. In Bay Area, there were, I think, 22 out of the 26 practitioners that showed up were people of color. And we didn't even have the conversation about whether it was a social justice movement. It was so clear that, you know, we all intersect with criminal justice reform, anti-sexual violence movements, racial justice movements that didn't even come up as a conversation. And Bay Area, the Bay Area also has a lot of um, a, a budding kind of movement. In Baltimore, I think because some communities maybe felt, or people of color felt more isolated from a, a general community that was doing restorative justice in that kind of way, it felt like, well, this is really not a social movement. You know, this is not a social justice movement. This is a tool. It's a good tool. We should offer it out to other movements. So I would give that as a really good example of the differences. Um, I would also say that just wanting to make some kind of relationship to transformative justice where you know, transformative justice, the notion of it is that it is birthed out of a deep understanding of the intersection of oppression, right? Um, and a lot of the practices are actually somewhere similar with, with restorative justice, but um, the being birthed from that place versus not being birthed from that place is, is kind of a point of, of difference. Um, I think for people that have been engaging in restorative justice, like as a social justice movement, um, we naturally sort of bend in that way towards transformative justice, towards thinking about this you know, deeply as an embedded um, RJ, SJ kind of thing. I'm, I hope I'm making some sense. I'm gonna whip through the other two things. Um, but the point was that there's a lot of work to do. Um, there were some things that had come up in, in the sessions themselves. Um, it was really clear. Uh, there was a beautiful, beautiful session in Minnesota. There were some things that came up and some commitment that um, the practitioners in Minnesota really wanted to kind of actually have circles around um, my sound is going in and out. Okay. Um, uh, uh, practitioners that really wanted to do some anti oppression work. Um, and then I will say the last, I'll just, I'll just touch on number four and leave number five, um, is the sense of offering more trainings um, and maintaining the integrity of practice. So I would say that, um, and I, I think Carl really highlighted it well, that um, there was this kind of call for having trainings that were subsidized and visible, that there aren't enough kind of trainings out there, that training should also be locally rooted, not flying people from across the country, but really, um, really kind of tapping into local wisdom. And then there was this beautiful piece that came out of Baltimore around these sort of sense of pillars of wisdom, right? And that if we were to try to define what is wisdom, like what actually makes a good practitioner, how do we break that down? to not just, not just forefront like aptitude and skill, but really talk about community wisdom. Like when you come from the community, what kind of wisdom do you bring? 
um, and the wisdom of directly impacted people, right? And if we were to think about those different pillars um, of, about what makes somebody a wise practitioner, um, that we really have to be equally weighting community and directly impacted folks. Um, I'm gonna stop there and I think we're gonna move on. Oh, and we're moving on to me. <laughs> And I'm just going to say this really briefly because I think I already said it and it's been said a few times is really um, having this kind of acknowledgement that there are, um, you know, can we be at a place where we acknowledge that there are sort of two roots of restorative justice, right? And that there is a whole very vibrant Western route um, that is um, from the listening session we spent some time in the Navajo Nation. Um, there were four people that came from three different nations in British Columbia, the Hetsuk Nation, the Nixa Nation, I apologize for saying the nation's wrong, and the Stolo Nation. Um, people talk often in these communities about the Maori, folks talk about other people in the Yukon, um, and the Sioux, and the Tapish and Clinket, right? And so how do we, when we're doing this work, continue to always acknowledge that there is really multiple roots of restorative justice um, as we move forward. And I think with that, I'm gonna sort of turn it over to Carl to kind of keep it going. Great, thank you, Sonia. And um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do a little bit of tracing and this is my, my sort of view as I continue to read and wrestle with this movement. And um, when I entered it in 1991, we weren't using the, the term movement, but sort of the Western tracking uh, of this route a little bit, if you will. And I would say it's, um, you know, in the beginnings in the early 70s, when this first came out, it was practice driven. And when it's, and, and a practice driven process tends to stay um, focused on the individual transformation initially. And I think there was so much excitement around this sort of magic of the individual transformation that it would be fair to say that, um, Initially, restorative justice was primarily conceived as a social service, uh, a legal diversion process aimed at transforming individuals entangled in the criminal justice system um, and with the possibility or byproduct of that time of change within families that were involved or communities, but that wasn't the focus. And, and so I think it was seen at that point as, as some, you know, on a menu of many social services, that various professionals could choose from. And, and I think that served uh, its, its purpose for a period of time. It helped us to um, deepen the practice and so on. At the same time, it fell prey to what we in the Western professionalized sort of um, individualized culture tend to do. And that is we broke everything down into small bits and pieces and we tried to practice it as a social service in every place we could. And, um, but we failed to continue to make the linkages uh, of restorative justice and its effect on a system or a culture or a society or a macro level change. And, 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 and I would say there are many points in which it transitioned. I don't think it immediately transitioned to a social movement process either. I think one of the indicators would be um, Howard Zare's Changing Lenses uh, publication, and there would be other authors along with him, but really with that came the idea of a paradigm shift. And I think this was pre-social movement, but the radical nature of the paradigm shift was this idea for the first time that this was more than a social service movement. This had the potential to change a whole paradigm, to change a whole system. But again, it was still attached to the criminal justice system primarily. And so what, what, what transpired at that point is sort of a rift within our own work of the sort of reformer types who are saying, let's reform the criminal justice system from inside, and that's where the paradigm shift will happen, to the sort of revolutionary turn that was saying, no, we cannot transform this system from within. It will be too compromising, will be too co-opted, and therefore we run a parallel process completely outside of this system. And the two of those um, sort of reformer revolutionary voices were not necessarily coordinating nor speaking to each other nor communicating well. In fact, they were working um, at times against each other. And I think this sort of put an internal wrestle in there. And part of it was that paradigm, the very concept was, was, um, was captured by or, or constrained by a sort of Thomas Kuhnian idea of paradigm shift, which sort of gave this idea that we have to 
deconstruct the whole system and reconstruct a whole new system and, and put it on as a blueprint before we can sort of make that shift. And I think what we've moved into is a sense of a social movement and how that's happened is when we begin to de-link restorative justice from only the criminal justice system and begin to see its effective practice in many other sectors. And as we began to do that, um, we saw a social movement that emerged that sort of basically was holding together a personal and a structural transformation and healing process. So the justice, the healing justice bit was driving that. And at the same time, we understood that while we're transforming ourselves personally and structures, we could also uh, work for and uh, let's see, form ourselves, make formations in such a way that we could believe there could be a cultural or attitudinal shift that would happen. And that was the beginning of a sense that there's something bigger uh, than, than just one institutional paradigm shift a social service or one institutional paradigm shift, and that this was something that was affecting multiple sectors in society as a movement. And then on top of that came the discussion, you have social movements and you have social justice movements. And as, as Sonia highlighted, that's, that's you know, very much in, in, in tension and in debate now, what does restorative, uh, what exactly restorative justice is accomplishing in that regard. But I think the sense of a social movement has come about with this new sense that we are holding together all of these facets uh, of the history in a new way. So I think what's important in all of this is language too. And of course, that was something talked about in every site as we move through. Certainly um, there was not full agreement or consensus on the language we use. So we had a strong sense of um, you know, our indigenous uh, communities and brothers and sisters saying, we call this a peace building circle. And that makes sense to us. Peace building is that, is that, that terminology, at least in the English language, that, that, that captures what we're doing and, and we're holding on to that. Though there was debate around that very term of peace building within the different traditions of the First Nations and Native communities. Um, and then, of course, our con constant tension with restorative justice or restorative practices and, and what does that mean? And is one um, larger than the other and, and, and over, overseeing the other? And I think that's an ongoing debate that needs to be, be had. I would say um, those who are holding for, out for restorative justice would see this as very importantly, a social justice movement and therefore justice needs to be in that language um, and that we lose that in, in, in broadening the language or generalizing the language to the point of restorative practices. Others saw that as a very um, practical uh, language issue that restorative practices was referring to certain skills and restorative justice to the ethos and the philosophy and the theory behind it. So those will be continued discussions to have. Um, okay, I think I'm up again. Um, so we, we, we thought it was important for us to just take a moment to say something about our personal reflections and our own takeaways and, and then kind of open it up to everybody about how they can use this report. And I can share a couple of examples. Um, so I think I wanna start by sharing what the, 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 the biggest takeaway for me and also that really has really informed my own work and the work of the Ahimsa Collective is to not shy away from the notion that healing and justice are relational and interdependent. Um, I feel like when I have watched the movement and I have watched my colleagues and I've watched the conversation, I've often felt a little bit like, oh, am I not allowed to say that actually whatever I'm doing might not have a justice outcome. It's not really restorative justice if it's not um, decreasing someone's sentence. So then what do I call it? You know, it's just healing oriented. And um, kind of the, the something really allowed me to open up much more and really claim that this is about healing and justice. Um, this is about a holistic sense of kind of balance and equanimity for me. Um, and that, that, that it all is relational. Um, and I feel like that was really the biggest takeaway and it was so big, I can't, I can't sort of um, really describe on a webinar how big it was for me. Um, the other piece was just around, um, you know, really the recognition of the tensions. Like, you know, as people are talking about their fears of what happens with co-optation, right? 
RJ is like the term and everybody wants to use it and people call everything they do RJ, you know, how it loses its meaning. Um, how, um, and, and just kind of what that feels like to folks and what does it mean to have integrity? What does it mean to have, um, be really strong about values? Um, and just hearing other people's feel, fears and sort of anxieties kind of validated my own, um, which I think is so much more, it's just like, it's named, it's out there. Okay, great, now we know. Um, and probably it allowed me to just embrace restorative justice more as like a thing with all of its flaws and foibles, with all of its conflicting kind of histories and, and tensions, um, but really sort of see things, um, you know, in terms of uh, the big tent and that, you know, that there are, there are places where something can tr be true and something else can be true at the same time and really live out that non-binary way of being that there are, there is such a thing that two or three or four things can be a little contradictory and true at the same time. So I would say that those were my biggest takeaways as well as uh, my last one, which actually relates to how this report can be used. And I'm going to put you, David Usim, on blast a little bit. Um, uh, yesterday, we had a, a little conversation just about David uh, runs or is the coordinator for Oakland Unified School District restorative justice programs. We had a really robust conversation about circle and circle process and the beautifulness of circle process that came from the Takish and Clinkett um, clans that has been really passed through a lot of the Western community um, by Kay Pranis and others, but it is, it is just simply one form of circle. Um, the Navajo Nation doesn't use that form of circle, not, neither does the Maori, they use their form, neither do, do other people. And how do we um, just offer out a kind of larger framework around even just sort of what circle means? Um, and that fundamentally, if we're in agreement that we're talking about a community-based process that is centering, um, a community process that is centering, um, dealing with harm, conflict, community building and healing, um, can we just, can that be the big tent? And that the processes that then get used are really specific to your context, your community, where you learn things, um, and then how you develop and grow. And that was a huge, um, that's just been a huge personal uh, learning. And I think Sarah and Carl are gonna share theirs and then we'll ask you how this report can be used. Um, yeah, I've been struggling to, when we decided to add this part to the presentation, I was like, shoot, how am I going to pick one? <laughs> and so um, I think really, though, to make it to make it personal, um, so I'm from Minnesota. Uh, I went to Virginia for school, and now I'm, I'm back in Minnesota. And the session that we had here, um, it was the first time that kind of a larger group of restorative justice practitioners had gathered in about two years. Um, and I think... I mean, that, that was the first session that we had, and it was kind of echoed across all the other sessions of how important it is for these folks to gather together, um, either from the same city or the same region or the same state or what have you, um, but just really emphasizing, like, we do, we do this, you know, out of a sense of, like, prioritizing and honoring relationship. And so hopefully then that also means that we are in relationship with each other as, as people who, who hold this thing together. Um, and so um, something that's been really wonderful to see in Minnesota, at least, is moving back and there. Are, um, some people who participate in the session have been really, I think, doing a wonderful job of gathering people um, in ways that weren't happening all the time before. And that, to me, is very um, inspiring and positive and exactly like, yay, it's, it wasn't exactly the intent of the listing project, but it's a really great kind of like side outcome <laughs> that happened because of it. And that's exciting and also um, I think even the exercise of having a listening project um, kind of helped create some networks and bridging of like Sony and I were each at each session so now that I when I encounter people you know in Minnesota for example I'm like oh you should really talk to this one person in Oakland or this person from Vancouver and just making those connections in ways that are more fruitful perhaps than just like a random networking at a conference or something like that um, and so I guess just a lot of hope around what can come out of this, um, not just from a funding standpoint, but really from a relational standpoint of how do we have these conversations and hold these tensions and do this work together. So I'll just say a little bit, this has been an, a tremendous process for me. And, and I think we might've mentioned it, but maybe not as clearly. This comes out of three years of us as the Zare Institute intentionally walking into um, 
a three-year process of cons consultation, conferencing, and writing um, to try to figure out how do we accompany or um, walk alongside this movement, this growing movement as we see it. For me, it's been very personally um, important on a number of fronts. In my personal practice uh, here locally in Harrisonburg, we have set up a coalition. Uh, it's the Harrisonburg Restorative Justice Coalition, which involves the police, the schools, uh, community mediation center, two universities, and other members that are doing community organizing, activism, and, and, and so on. This has been um, particularly challenging and very, very um, adventurous for us in this small town of Harrisonburg. And, and, and I think I would say what's, what one of my biggest learnings in that is, is the, the attitude shift that needs to happen to move away from nonprofit mentalities to coalition mentalities. And the nonprofit mentality is the idea that you, you have some programmatic goals and we can measure them and see them. And the coalition should also have goals, but it's about um, holding together people who are doing practice and hopefully in that togetherness and in that new form of communication and partnership, each of our work is being multiplied to its, its fullest, its maximum. And that's been hard to hang on to. We're constantly being asked, how many cases do you have? Well, the coalition doesn't have cases. The coalition is encouraging everyone to work at RJ within their policies and structures in their organizations. So getting folks to sort of understand what the coalition exists for and what its benefit would be, and we see it that it will benefit many sectors in the city, but how do we capture that data of how restorative justice is, is, is moving into cultural changes in the schools, in the community, in the university and so on. And how do we capture that data? How do we present it? And how do we understand that benefit and move away from the, the call to show action that is measurable by cases uh, or whatever that might be? So that's part of our ongoing discussion and figuring out what does the coalition structure look like and how does it best meet our needs? Um, and how do we keep decentralizing and not move into hierarchical thinking with leadership teams and so on like that. So there's a lot of questions coming out of that. It's all great. It's a great place to experiment, but it has its own conflicts and tensions. The other thing is um, in my own work academically with curriculum development, and I was really um, privileged to be able to co-teach with Jody Geddes out of Our Joy last summer in our Summer Peace Building Institute, and we looked at restorative justice and community organizing. There's not much written in those two fields together, but trying to bring the, the literature of both of those fields and the practice of both of those fields together and reflect on that was, was a joy and also a challenge. And one of our courses that we've developed here in our own master's program is restorative justice and systems approaches to change, which has been very challenging for our students and, and very rewarding to begin to say, how do we keep track of restorative practices, values, and principles, and look at macro change and build a portfolio around that? And lastly, I would say this has continued to inform my international work, and I do think there's a global movement that's catching on too. One place that we are seeing that I'm particularly excited about, and I've talked about it before in probably some of our webinars, but that is in transitional justice processes that are indigenous and more restorative. It's clear that a social movement needs to occur for this nation or this country to heal. And it's no longer acceptable to drop an institution like a truth commission or an international criminal court on this context. Uh, unless it comes from the bottom up. And that's where I'm seeing movement work happening in many parts of the world. So maybe we're gonna talk about how the report can be used. <clears throat> Sonia. Did we lose Sonia? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Okay. I think one of the things we were we were wanting to put out there to you, and we're going to go into Q and A now. We need to for time wise. So I'm going to turn it to um, uh, Washe here soon. But one of the things we'd love to hear from you, um, who've been able to interact with the report at all, or even from from what we've been talking about here, is how do you think this report can be used um, further, um, so it doesn't just remain a report. Do 
I will stop share this. And then we can move into the. Oh, there's Sonia. There we go. <laughs> Perfect timing. Did you want to talk a little bit about how this report came? Oh you guys, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I live in the Bay Area in this perfect storm of a place where the internet just goes out like whenever it feels like it. So uh, anyway, my apologies for that. Um, the, really quickly, we just wanted to turn it over to folks, but I was listening. And if I go out, you know, you have each other. Um, how can the support be used? And I think we could give a couple of examples um, that, we, that would be useful. So far, was um, one um, for, um, in February doing a panel in India. There's somebody that's not on mute, so one of our, our panelists, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, for both, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing. Great, thank you so much. Um, is that in our three day workshop that we're doing in India, where it's restorative justice is really kind of in a newer place? Um, I know Sujatha's done a, a uh, uh, training there. Um, I think a couple other people have done some trainings there. Um, can, you, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, you can still hear me. Um, is that we talked about doing two days of really kind of deep you know, process experiential and really the third day, their request was, would you focus on the report? Um, because there was so much really useful information about where your struggles are as a movement. You've been kind of in it for a little longer. Um, and we really want to be able to kind of think through um, where we might be having similar or different struggles and really been really thinking about actually using some of the similar exercises we did in the listening sessions for that. Um, another piece is, you know, again, David, I'm going to put you on blast one more time because we had a really beautiful conversation yesterday about how just talking about these things really as practitioners, as we convene and meet and talk, how does it just, how do we get better at what we do? How do we let things inform our practices? How do we let our um, allow for these kinds of moments where we've captured some information or we've captured people's thinkings or this is a collective shared document that's also just a slice. It's just a, a, a real small slice of folks doing work. How do we let that inform kind of the way that we're thinking about um, the things that we need in the movement, the state of the state of RJ for ourselves? Um, I also didn't really mention anything on the recommendations about funding because I was feeling like I was talking too long, but I would say one of the big takeaways with the funding recommendations is to do more collaborative sort of work together around funding, right? So to have more collaborative proposals, to do more collaborative sort of technical assistance. I use a lot of people's offices now. Um, there's so much more shared sense of shared resources um, with each other. So what you know sarah mentioned in minnesota of like where you know can we get back to the place where we're just meeting and talking um and sharing bread and sharing stories and sharing our practices and when we do that and when we're in dialogue um what changes in the nature of our work itself when we're hearing and listening to each other so that's what i wanted to share as we kick off that the sense of how can the report be used Okay, wow. Thank you all so very much. Uh, it's a good thing that I am not writing in questions because we'd be here the rest of the day answering them, I do believe. Um, I would like to start uh, with a question uh, that relates to what we were most recently listening to from Susan. Um, she asked, what ideas are there for how to measure benefits of culture change outside of counting cases? Carl, do you want to answer that since you were talking about measuring cases or Sonia, does that feel true for you to answer? Are you hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you. I mean, let me just jump in on that. That's a very good question. And I think that's precisely what you're going to see the tension in this whole report around, well, how do we measure what we're doing? And what, what do we think about when we think about impact and coherency? in the movement and, and, and what, is that, what does that look like and feel like? So I think we're all in sort of experimental phase in that very question. Um, I think what we're trying to get capture, for instance, in the coalition locally, is we're trying to capture beyond the cases, we're trying to capture the data, how many people are actually involved in the processes? Because we know that everyone who's involved in a, in a conference or a circle conference 
or an RJ process that has multiple parties and their support networks, they've all been affected in different ways. How do we capture how that's impacted um, broader than the individuals directly involved? How do we capture um, the sort of preventative work that restorative justice is doing, for instance, in schools? So how would we, how would we begin to capture the idea of um, uh, how, much, how much have, have circles been reducing um, the, the kinds of tensions that have take, gotten to the attention of the sort of regular, um, um, you know, expelling or, or suspending folk? And, and how do we look at, for instance, um, decreased uh, incidences of conflict or other kinds of forms of harm on the university campuses when we start using restorative justice versus a judicial process. And so it, it's gonna mean we're gonna capture a more qualitative data, but also um, looking at, at numbers and whole sectors. So how is thinking changing? You know, it should be connected. Don't, don't get me wrong, this isn't a way to cover for not doing the hard work. So locally, we also should be keeping track of, is our jail um, continuing to get overcrowded and, and why? And, and therefore, what are we, how, why aren't we able to divert? Where are the, where are the, the hangups? And, and so this is, it's a, it's, a, it's a tension between the sort of quantitative numbers and the qualitative work that we're doing, but broadening the discussion beyond the cases as they might be identified by the system, the criminal justice system, particularly. Thank you. Um, This is um, a question that is actually both for you, uh, Carl and Sonia. It uh, follows up a little bit with where you're taking us. Um, so David asks, uh, he says, the coalition is certainly an improved mental and philosophical framework, but he's wondering if there is a shared imagination about what societal structural changes the coalition is leading towards. For both you and Sonia, I'm not sure who wants to answer. Sonia's lost. Oh, did we lose Sonia again? So, I'm um, sorry we lost Sonia again. Let me jump in then. So until Sonia comes in, but I'd love to have Sonia jump into that conversation. Thanks, David. Um, I very important question again that I think we're just wading into and and trying to understand. Um, I agree with you. I think uh, looking at the broader um, sort of philosophical thing of, of coalition building um, and how we, how we imagine that. I think what I'm imagining is a shared vision that says, how do we do justice nonviolently? And I know this gets a little bit um, theoretical maybe or philosophical, but you know, part of the problem with our criminal justice system is its obsession with the past and the present and how do we punish who did wrong in the past or harmed in the past and how should they be dealt with in the present in a, in a punitive way? And then we're, we're reinventing the cycles of violence that are, that are so closely linked to justice now in our popular society. And what would it be like to say, we have something to pass on to the next generation that redefines justice nonviolently? It's an intergenerational vision that says we can get beyond um, um, this idea of, of violent justice we can break that cycle and we can set up institutions or we can deconstruct and reform institutions, whether they be our educational, political or economic systems that, um, that strive for justice without violence. That's pretty idealistic, but um, is there ways we could begin to give that new language? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is a question, uh, Great question from Dwayne. He's talking about his experience in restorative justice trainings and programs where um, there is talk about including anti-racism, anti-oppression, white advantage, et cetera, into the training materials. But he's saying that he doesn't really see much incorporated into these materials that's giving facilitators real tools to invite the conversation. So he's asking for some insight, uh, specifically for you, Carl, the question. Well, I mean, the, what you're describing is, I think, the experience of many of us. Yeah, we, we, we have not integrated our restorative justice training work well with um, anti-racism, anti-oppression work. That's been 
um, siloed and categorized too, again, in these sorts of binary thinking of that sort of social activism or, trans, or transformative justice, and we do another kind of justice. And, and I think we have to have, just as we're asking these practices to be in um, conversation with each other, we have to start thinking about our curriculum and training to be in conversation with each other. There is plenty of really good training out there around anti-racist uh, and anti-oppression work. Um, I think the key would be linking that into the restorative and healing elements of justice and beginning to understand um, how do those come together. And so it wouldn't be just a matter of merging the two without thinking about the, the, the philosophical um, inter integration of the two. And one thing that I would think about would be trauma healing and the understanding of trauma healing being one of the critical bridges between anti-oppression, anti-racism work and um, restorative justice or healing justice processes. And, and um, but if you're looking specifically for materials, um, be in touch with us and, and there may be many others who could, could offer some really important material. And if you have um, the unction uh, to, to begin to integrate that material more into our restorative justice training, by all means, we would welcome more conversation around that. I think I'm gonna just add in a quick shout out. I saw, so I think Cynthia Prosak is, on the call, and she um, heads up the organization called Restorative Justice Community Action here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. And I know that her organization does some work around restorative justice and implicit bias. I haven't been able to attend one of those um, trainings or gatherings yet, but she might be someone to reach out to, um, trying to, you know, like do that intersection of how do we talk about race and racial justice as restorative justice practitioners. Um, just as one example, I know people are working on the topic. Um, I haven't agree. I agree with Carl. I have not seen curriculums go by or, you know, different, different training materials and things like that. But I think there is momentum and movement in that direction from a variety of different points. So hopefully we'll see that come to fruition in the near future. Thank you. Um, Georgia has a question following up on David's previous question and She's asking um, about why she's curious about the choice of term coalition versus community or communities. I don't think we made a conscious choice and I wouldn't want to make that choice around language again. I think we used communities and communities um, quite frequently. I don't know if, if it seems like one, uh, a certain language is being used more in the report. We'd have to look into that, but communities and community work, community organizing, community activism are all part of um, what we would be strongly encouraging as we talk, as we talk about the restorative justice movement. Um, when we use coalition, there was some discussion, and this gets into more technicalities. Those who sort of there were some who interpreted the word alliances, for instance, as being a group of people who have a very set agenda and they have a unified uh, voice around a set agenda of change that they want to do. And that didn't represent the restorative justice movement in their minds. Um, and so coalition was more around um, how do we describe this partnership of collaboration? It could be called collaboratories, another word that's out there, or building collaboratories, um, but the idea of moving beyond um, individual uh, practitioners or individual organizations working alone. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question um, from, oh, I'm so sorry, give me one second. I just lost it. Oh yeah, following up again with uh, language seems so important and uh, what definitions mean to different individuals. So Malik is asking, what indigenous traditions have been identified within other communities of color? Uh, Malik is listing Latino, Black, African, Arab, etc. So what other uh, communities of color manifest restorative justice practice and principles in the same way as your description of indigenous traditions? Sonia, I don't know if you caught that. I'd love for you to jump in here. But if oh, yeah. No, I, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of out on the road now. You, you'll love, you'll just love this, all of you. So can you repeat the question and I can, I'm sure I can answer it. Oh, great. They just erased it. But so we'll see how good my short-term memory is. 
uh, Malik, I believe the, the person's name was Malik. I'm sorry if I don't have the name correct. Uh, basically was asking um, within the conversation about indigenous cultures and the relationship between restorative practices, restorative justice practices and indigenous teachings was asking, I believe, what relationship do you see with um, other people of color uh, and listed Latino, Arab, um, Black Africans, I don't recall the other uh, groups that he, he or she specifically mentioned, but what connection relationship do you see between those peoples and indigenous teachings in regard to restorative justice? Thanks. Um, so at any time, somebody just jump on and tell me if you can't hear me. Um, I think there's something about a lot of this work um, that is really works hand in hand with people talking about their ancestors and intergenerational trauma and also kind of what is the wisdom of our own community and our own cultural context, right? And that's not always so clear. Um, if we come from, you know, big multicultural urban environments, if we've lost family in kind of a refugee situation, if there's a descendant of, uh, descendants of slavery. Um, so it's not always so clear what that is. And at the same time, there's something about, I think, the discovery of um, what does my really specific cultural um, context kind of, how does it help to inform me? And even if that cultural context is, um, is the, the shared tra trauma of genocide. Um, one of the things I think in um, the Navajo Nation listening session and also in British Columbia that came up with the four participants there was there was no shying away from sort of trauma um, and of genocide and colonialism and the Treaty of 1868, you know, for the Navajo that was really, um, you know, dis just destroyed the entire life way. And so the question wasn't necessarily like, okay, now we need to recreate, you know, a former life way. It's just how do we, how do we re revitalize, like how do we re kind of reinform ourselves in terms of our own practices? And I think I think any of us can do that in our specific cultural context. And I think that there's a sense of being in a shared urban environment. I live in the Bay Area. I grew up in New York. I grew up around every single type of person on the planet. Um, I, I'm South Asian. And there was a way we had to create our own shared history and shared language based on our location and where we were. Um, and some of that is the deep, deep, deep understanding of how racial justice operates. And some of it is just understanding how marginalization operates, how um, white privilege op operates, how um, just trauma, childhood trauma operates. So I think within that, when we're doing that kind of work, and I, I saw the, another question about, and I think it was from Dwayne earlier about, you know, there's reference to sort of oppression um, and privilege, but it, it doesn't usually show up in training manuals and how do you invite that conversation? And I think it's such the elephant in the room with so much of this work when we're in multicultural spaces that you know, that we, it's, it's almost like if we, in, as a facilitator, often as a trainer, if we invite the conversation, we're, you know, we're, we're worried about the elephant and the explosion and kind of how this is like um, hundreds of years of history that we actually have to reckon with and deal with. And so to not assume that we're going to be able to um, tackle that in like a single circle or tackle that in um, a single process, but to embed really, really deeply in all of our conversations and all of our outcomes and all of our processes from, you know, the micro circle that we do face-to-face -face dialogue to the macro design of, um, of an RJ process to understanding the minute that somebody's sitting um, in front of you that is different, I don't know anything about where they're coming from or their history. I don't know anything about their cultural context. I don't know anything about how it shows up. And um, it's kind of my work to figure out how to be in that space. So that's what I would say. And in terms of um, learning from indigenous wisdom, I feel like, you know, um, you know I mean, I, I can only answer that personally, which is I feel myself deeply, deeply informed by, um, uh, just deeply informed by wisdom that ha is talking about ancestry and is also talking about genocide and is not sugarcoating one or the other um, and is talking about it in a way to try to figure out how to be, um, how to be in oneself how to be in one self and in relationship to others and how to be in relationship to nature and just equanimity. Thanks. Um, just to add on, so Rick Kelly, it looks like he responded as well. 
um, that um, Ali Gohar in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Loya Herga um, also talks about their presence throughout the mid Middle East and then John Braithwaite's work. So to back onto what Sonia was saying about working with other populations um, and their restorative justice slash indigenous practices. Uh, and I've lost my questions, but I'm going to do my best to remember one in particular. And I believe the person's name was John talking about working. Uh, oh, yeah, we found it. Uh, working in communities outside of schools and criminal justice. They sometimes run into folks who are very focused on uh, advocating for punitive measures. Um, thank you. Okay, <laughs> I've got another computer here. Sorry. Um, so this is an excellent question because I think so often, um, particularly in the early uh, development of a practitioner, we tend to You are freezing, Wansha. We've lost you, Wansha. I can I can see the question. So if you want, I can ask it. Is that? Yeah, let's go ahead with that so we can get that sorted. Okay. So um, this is from John. So working in communities outside of schools and criminal justice, we sometimes run into folks, including in marginalized groups, who advocate for punitive response to conflicts and harm. Okay. Just hang on a second. I'm not losing this. Um, seriously. Okay. Uh, once what, what, she's coming back, she had a little bit of problem, but she's coming back at this one. All right, hang on, I need to go find the question. It just moved. Um, there we go. I'm wondering if presenting restorative justice and contrast to punitive systems is the best way to go. Is there a better way to talk about justice? Period. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I take a, a, just a first try at that question? Yeah. This is, yeah? So I just want to say that um, you know, one of the big things named that was a shared value in the listening session and pretty every movement conversation I've had is the notion that restorative justice is not a quick fix, it's a paradigm shift. Yes. And paradigm shifts take very, very, very long times. And particularly in systems and institutions that are used to quick fixing um, and want and need quick solutions to walk into a situation where people are used to doing things punitively to shift um, to a paradigm shift underpinning everything is just uh, that painstaking hard work, I think, of showing up over and over and over and over again, should you choose to work in an institutional setting. Or the kind of code switching that needs to happen in order to first, uh, you know, have somebody understand what you're talking about, and then slowly work towards that paradigm shift. So I think underpinning... Um, you know, all of this, this space of how, um, how to get away, how to, how to sort of work with people that are more steeped in a, in a punitive model is to, is to do, is to do that, um, as well as understand that the punitive model comes from somewhere, you know, that there's, there's under, underpinnings and under roots to people feeling really angry. Um, this is less institutional and more, if we think about the current sort of outcry of um, of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, there's anger. There's a lot of anger. And there needs to be a place for anger. And there needs to be a place for, um, for all of that expression. And at some point, we can also have the conversation that that doesn't also have to mean um, being punitive. And uh, again, back to the non-sort of binary way of being, we can be really, really angry, and we don't have to advocate for punitive outcomes. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, and I want to uh, share a little bit. This question comes from Rick, uh, relating to the questions linking um, of structures before. Um, so he's asking, building on these questions of linking to societal structures, how does this RJ movement have a voice for the environment and address environmental harm? Could you hear me? Yes. Okay, just make so sure. So I'll, I'll just jump in. 
without knowing specifically where we might have brought that environmental discussion into the report completely, it certainly was in the discussions in the three years leading up to it. And the anthology that we hope will get published in uh, next year, 2018, will have a chapter looking at environmental work, uh, ecological RJ work, and so on. I think it's definitely embedded in the holistic worldview of, again, our indigenous um, First Nations and Native American communities, for sure. We've seen that. That's been in the public and the media. I think we have to develop that conversation in new ways. We certainly know that first persons working with ecological environmental harm have found restorative justice frameworks, principles and practices very beneficial for helping them to understand that. And it's literally saying the environment you know, that we live in and that surrounds us is also a stakeholder and is, is, is a recipient of harm uh, in this whole um, human coexistence. And, and um, we need to take that seriously. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done in that. And I think we need to center that even more in our work. Just to say, um, keep your eyes on the Zare Institute. And this isn't meant to be a shameless plug. It's just to say there is a connection. We do want to run another short um, two-day training coming up in May, I believe. But the information is not there yet, which will be looking at RJ and ecology and um, environmental issues um, as, as it's being practiced locally here. Okay, great. Thank you, Carl. We've got just a couple of minutes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a couple questions together. Um, this is from Eric and Harun. Um, so first of all, if this is a movement, what would be the answer if somebody asked, what is the movement seeking? And related to that, how does the traditional, this person Eric is talking about the traditional legal system, how does it view this movement? Um, this is Sonia. I really don't know if you can see me, but at least I know you can hear me. Um, yeah. I don't think I can answer the second question because I'm not a law practitioner. But I would say for the first question, um, you know, I think I said it earlier, which is just that can we agree or do we feel like this is at least, at its least, in its broadest tent, in its biggest umbrella, a community a community process that is um, not something that we outsource to a state or an institution, but a community process in our community that's dealing with harm, um, conflict, and um, trauma and violence um, and community building, right? So the community-based process that's really about resolving conflict, harm, and building community um, is what I would say is probably um, a big piece that the movement is trying to accomplish. Mm. And I would add to that, I think the movement is, is, is interested in, in a societal, uh, cultural, attitudinal shift around what justice is and how it's going to be satisfied. And, and I think that's coming out of not only the movement, but the sense that many of our institutions, justice, education, economic, and so on, are relics of the modernist era and are very, and are starting to implode. They're, they're brittle and they're not suiting the they're not meeting the needs. They're not satisfying the needs, even though they're being propped up in many ways still. And so I think we're in the, we're in the midst of that sort of shift happening, that tipping point, that turning the corner. Um, I would say to the second question, um, I forget what that was now exactly, but remind me, Wanshe, there was a second question attached to that. Uh, I was what wondering how the criminal justice system yeah. views. And again, I'm not a criminal justice practitioner, but my sense is many in the criminal justice system don't even know about this movement or wouldn't call it a movement, don't, wouldn't recognize it as a movement. There would be those who would recognize restorative justice in a particular practice that is a diversionary component of the restorative justice system, and many of them would be happy for that uh, add-on diversionary practice. Um, I don't know that they would be understanding the significance of this social movement on the criminal justice at this system on a day, at this point on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. But um, if they're willing to look further um, and, and see some of the things that are coming together, I think they might see a movement outside of the walls of the criminal justice uh, mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. That would be, that would be um, surprising. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I can just say quickly, I uh, did a case uh, not too many months ago where the uh, victim in the case was also a police officer and uh, it was an amazing experience. But one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why this particular officer chose restorative justice as an option rather than filing charges was that his words, paraphrasing, he said that he looked at the trajectory that this 14 year old was facing and was very relieved to have recently learned that within his own department, there was an alternative to that trajectory. And skeptical as he was, he was willing to take a chance, take a risk, uh, what he thought was a healthy, good risk, uh, and was uh, quite transformed by the experience in the process, as was everybody that was involved. A beautiful example of you know, why we don't reduce that experience to a single digit numeral one. So, thank you. I just want to say one thing here. Yes, Sujata okay. put a great, Sujata Baliga just gave a great quote. She said, I think uh, one way to answer that is the legal system can look at RJ and, and see it as either propping up the system as it currently operates or working to make it obsolete. Yes. And I think yes. that's what we're after. Yes. Yes. And I think also uh, it's about remembering that the conversation isn't about community and the criminal justice system, that that system is made up of our neighbors and our relatives and our friends. So thank you everyone so much. Um, I believe I'm supposed to turn this over to Kajunga now, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, Wanshe, and Sonia, and Carl. Thank you so much for the presentation. Again, my name is Ikajun Turi, and I'm a graduate student at the Center for Justice and the Peace Building here in Nelsonburg, Virginia. I work as a graduate assistant for the Zed Institute, and I have a couple announcements to make before we close our session for today. First one, the series of, we have restorative justice and healing historical harms. This is a series uh, for webinar this uh, the, this this uh, semester, and the coming up there is history and the reconciliation initiative. Uh, this is the webinar coming on uh, December thirteenth. Please visit our uh, website for registration, which will be the next week, and that will be our last webinar for this series. So please remember to come back next week. Not long, not not long to go. Uh, we have STAR, which is uh, Strategic for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. You can go through our website and see what we offer from January to March 2018. Restorative Justice Graduate Certificate. Uh, this allows working professionals to continue working while completing their studies. It helps you to reflect on your work and increase your knowledge and skills. And this certificate may be all you need to, to epsilize your vision and your work. So please visit our, our website for registration. We offer restorative justice education. This is focused on education setup, K-12 educators. Please visit our website for more information and the registration is a powerful program for our schools to, uh, to prepare restorative justice culture. So please uh, visit our website for more information and the registration. Also, Center for Justice Peace Building, we offer two courses, which is a Master in Conflict Transformation, and we have new Masters in Restorative Justice, it's a wonderful one. You can visit our website and see our details and the registration, and you can join us for the, this coming year of, of academic. And last but not least, the Z Institute website is available as a source for upcoming events, resources, the schedule for upcoming webinars, and the response role for past webinars that are linked to YouTube. The recording for tonight's webinar will be available early next week by Monday. Now I'll take you back to Wonshe to finalize, to close with uh, close remarks. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, for your questions. There were some fabulous questions that I just didn't get time to present. Um, and thank, you, thank you, Sarah, Sonia, and Carl for all of your hard work, uh, your joy, and uh, your wisdom, and your questions and provocations. And uh, thank you everyone for listening and um, hope to do this again. Thank you for inviting me, Carl.
Adios. Thank you. Thank you. All of you next week uh, in in our webinar. <laughs>